The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Sami Shah. This is Ear to Asia. The way the political narratives has worked within modern China has been that the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, is the inevitable outcome of China's modernity and the Chinese civilization. Okay, that has been the kind of view of history that the CCP has tried to inject into its legitimacy. The CCP is the flag bearer of China's civilization moving forward. I think that is the kind of narrative that they are trying to create through this civilizational discussion. The Global Civilization Initiative is very tied with national security, it's very tied with development. So there were conditions on which some nations should be respected, some nations are not. Some people are respected, some people are not. It has to do with these people versus enemies. People who are considered as enemies of the people then don't deserve anything. In this episode, China wants to remake global governance. Is the world ready for it? Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialists at the University of Melbourne. Proposed by President Xi Jinping in 2023, China's Global Civilization Initiative, or GCI, envisions a fundamental overhaul of global institutions and aims to remake the future of global governance. On paper, the GCI is a blueprint for international relations that enshrines principles of mutual respect between civilizations, promoting diversity, common human values, and people-to-people exchange. Yet, some analysts argue it merely reflects China's strategy of reshaping international norms to its own benefit and garnering support for its own political model. The GCI is one of a trio of multilateral initiatives put forth by Beijing, the others being the Global Development Initiative and the Global Security Initiative, which have already drawn representatives from the Global South, signaling China's efforts to expand its international influence and partnerships as U.S. US global leadership appears increasingly shaky. But does the GCI possess genuine substance, or is it merely a public relations exercise? How might the GCI transform our understanding of human rights? Would all civilizations, to use the initiative's terminology, truly be considered equal under Beijing's proposal, or would China emerge as a natural civilizational hegemon? And what tangible outcomes is Beijing delivering under the aegis of the GCI. Joining me to look at China's Global Civilization Initiative and what it may mean for the world are seasoned China watchers and frequent guests of the program, Associate Professor Delia Lin and Dr. Soki Tok, both from Asia Institute. Welcome back to Air to Asia, Delia and Soki. Thank you very much, Sami. Great to be here again. Thanks, Sami. And hello, Delia, again. Hello, Soki. <laughs> So a bit of a reunion here. Let's start then first with you, Delia. Can you give us, in a nutshell, what is the GCI, the Global Civilization Initiative? Um, Thanks, Sammy. So basically, GCI was announced by Xi Jinping in his March 15th keynote speech um, to the Chinese Communist Party high-level dialogue with world political leaders in 2023. So as you've just mentioned, it's the third of the three global initiatives that China has put forward uh, after Global Development Initiative and Global Security Initiative. So nutshell of GCI uh, really is to promote multiple versions of modernity. And of course, on the face value is to treat all civilizations equal, especially Chinese civilization. Uh, but I'll pass on to Saki to give a bit more details. But nutshell is really to promote this idea of modernity, uh, Chinese, well, not necessarily China style modernity, because China style modernization, or in Chinese terms, uh, it's called the Chinese path to modernization. That is the key theme of the 20th CCP or CPC in Chinese terms, 20th Party Congress. So this is basically a moral and civilizational preparation for that vision of Chinese path to modernization. So is this then, Soki, 
tied directly into China's broader foreign policy vision? Um, one thing for sure is Xi Jinping doesn't drop things out from thin air for no reasons. And obviously, he has a big vision for what China would become in future and how it relates to the rest of the world. And to follow through from what Delia has said on modernity, I totally agree with that idea. It's about a different kind of modernity that the West has been preaching all the time. As in, like, you know, most of the time when we talk about modernity, we tend to talk about westernization. And in this case, China is trying to preach a different form of modernity that is separate from the status quo. And that is something that, you know, brings back the history of China, China's own path of how modernity should be achieved and how they should pursue it. And they hope to do it together with the rest of the global south and those with rich civilizational heritage. So I think that kind of spells out the kind of path that China is hoping to achieve in the long run, or at least a vision that it spelled out for those that were dissatisfied with Western style of modernity. So, Keith, so then what exactly are the key themes under the Global Civilization Initiative that Chinese officials are emphasizing? If, if we were to kind of look at just the main points that they want to get across through their announcement. I think the first thing just relates to what I just said. It has its own pathway, not the Western pathway of modernity. I think that is the fundamental principle behind this global you know, civilizational initiative. But on top of that, I think there is also a theme to try to unite all the different civilization, you know, and say that they own their own history. It's not a history that was written by the West. It is something that, relatively speaking, anti-West, but more like, you know, we are rejecting what the West is trying to tell us, okay, rather than totally refusing the West, okay, but something that is built on the pride of their own history, pride of their own heritage and uh, culture, and uh, it has a very strong element of ethno-nationalism behind all these narratives, and it's about all these different unique cultures and civilization coming together to uh, create a world that belongs to them. Delia, the word civilization in this, the Global Civilization Initiative, seems a bit archaic. It's not a word that's very often bandied about or used in international relations or, you know, international plans when major nations announce them. What's the significance here? Why civilization? Yeah, I think um, Saka's point is really important. That is a different way of framing modernity. Because when we think of modernization, we think of westernization, we think about technological advancement um, that's led by the USA, especially. So here is we're really looking at a very different way of framing modernity through civilizational perspective. And again, um, it's a word that's really used in talking about modernization, because civilization has so many meanings and it has been used by different societies in different ways and in China as well, in governance. And I think a way of looking at the mindset of Chinese government and why it's bring, bring civilization to the fore, what are the key themes, I think it's important to really, first of all, understand what they are saying themselves. Uh, I encourage the audience to also read a global community of shared future, China's proposals and actions published in September 2023. And I'll just quote um, the paper that how China sees the key themes of this whole GCI talk is that it calls for jointly advocating respect for the diversity of civilizations and seeing this as a as a premise for development and jointly advocating the common values of humanity, jointly advocating the importance of continuity and evolution of civilizations and jointly advocating closer international people-to-people -people exchanges and corporations. So all sound great. And the Global uh, Civilization Initiative makes a sincere call for the world to enhance inter-civilization exchanges and dialogue and promote human progress with inclusiveness and mutual learning, inspiring the building of a global community of shared future. Sorry to interrupt you, but what does civilization mean there? The meaning of the word civilization, you've said, means something very particular in the Chinese context. What is that? How is that different from the way, for example, people in the West might understand civilization? 
uh, a very good question. I think that's where discussion gets interesting. Is that when we look at the nuanced meaning of civilization, the different layers of the meanings of civilization, then that's where analysis really gets interesting. I mean, civilization has got this colonial legacy, so it can be used civilization. Then the opposite of it is savages. I mean, that's it has a colonial history, heritage of it. So it's very interesting. China is actually using that word that has a colonial heritage to basically decolonialize the discourse of progress and modernization.、Uh, is that going to work? I mean, that's that's really interesting. And if we look at the document of、uh, global community of shared future, China's proposal and actions, the word civilization. If you just look at the use of the word civilization, it has so many meanings. So it could be a collective group of、uh, people with civilization, with cultural heritage, as Salki mentioned, and that would resonate with a lot of civilizational states and states that with that long are proud of their cultural heritage. It can mean that. Sometimes it means behavior, the type of civilized behavior, especially in domestic civil、uh, sort of social governance, which is what I've been working on, and those regulations on civilized behavior. So that can be can be used as a almost like an adjective. It can also mean ideology and institution. If you look at the white paper of a global community of shared future, it's used with institution and ideology as well to say, well, that's part of civilization. So that's where it gets interesting. So it can carry that very strong political overtone. Yeah, indeed. The term civilization is hard to pin down, and、uh, as far as this discourse is concerned, it seems to act like a flag, which、uh, you know, asking for other so-called civilizations to rally around and say, "All right, whatever you call civilization, if you consider yourself a civilization, then." Yes, come round and join the party. We can come and forge a common future together. We can all celebrate our differences together. We can celebrate our cultures together, and、uh, yeah, that is something that would be you know running as a counter to what the West has been talking about all the while. You know, civilization does not belong to the West. Civilization belongs to us too. I think that is the kind of message that they were trying to send. So the important thing is not to see civilization as what it means, but you know. What it really the, allows, the of which, yeah, it allows into the discourse. I think that is the that is the beauty of this、uh, discourse in the very first place. Both of you have talked about how one of the main defining elements here is a break with the Western traditions with regards to modernity, with regards to civilization, with regards to cultures and harmony, etc. Just focusing on, for example, modernity. What is the difference here? What would Chinese modernity or the symbol of Chinese modernity through the GCI look like when compared to the Western model of modernity and whatever that might be? Soki. Um, the way the political narratives has worked within China, modern China, has been that the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, is the inevitable outcome of China's modernity and the Chinese civilization. Okay, that has been the kind of teleological、uh, view of history that the CCP has tried to inject into its legitimacy, and that civilization pretty much follows through from there. As in, the CCP is the end. Of China's civilization is the is the flag bearer of China's civilization moving forward. I think that is the kind of narrative that they are trying to create through this civilizational discussion. So politically, it means a lot to the CCP because it means that it lends legitimacy to a system that is. Not directly elected.、Uh, if you consider how elections, so-called elections, are being conducted in China, there is no feedback system. But they try to create an aura that they were legitimate rulers of the Chinese civilization, and that is something that Xi Jinping has been trying to achieve since he gained power back in 2012. You know the way that he brought in history, the way that、uh, he brought in how、um, the CCP is a part of the Struggle of Chinese modern history, in particular, and how CCP is forging China's modernity in the name of the Chinese nation. So that is the kind of narrative that all all come together in one big round. Delia, is that then China saying that the end result of any great civilization is the CCP? And if you're part of the GCI, then you should also work towards a CCP-like or you know just be under the CCP organization. 
Um, of course, that's not on the paper. <laughs> so is it an implicit message? Yes. The implicit message is absolutely there. But what I would like to add that is also a civilization、uh, in the Chinese text, and also means humankind, also means human society, because the guiding party for this GCI is the Chinese Communist Party. That's given. So if the whole world buys in it, then the CCP is basically the world leader. It's not just a national leader. So the political legitimacy problem is completely solved once for all. But The way it achieves this is not to say how great CCP is in the document, but to actually highlight this is for the survival, very survival of human society, because civilization is also defined as human society as well in the document. So to say that human society basically is at a crisis, and if we don't do something about it, the human society, which is winning, is going to disappear for the whole world. One of the aspects of the human society that there seems to be a great deal of focus on, especially when it comes to China-related topics, is human rights.、Uh, does the GCI address human rights as we commonly understand them? Soki, yeah, very interestingly, the most important part of GCI is the、uh, diversity, the emphasis on diversity, and that is in direct rejection of、uh, what we so call universal values. So in this case, you know, again, human rights as a modern concept、uh, was very much owned by the West as far as this discourse is concerned, and human rights, if it exists within the CGI, is actually something that everyone should have their own set of definition vis-a-vis -vis human rights. No one human right is above another, so to speak. So China could have its own. Version of human rights as much as Russia could have its own version of human rights as much as India could have its own version of human rights. The emphasis of civilization is precisely because of that. Okay, we all have our heritage, we all have our values, we all have our customs, and human rights should not be something that is divorced from those kind of heritage, values, and history. That we come from. So in this case, China would say, "Okay, we have a set of human rights that's unique to China and applied to China, and being administered by the CCP." Okay, and that should not contradict with that in Russia or in India. Okay, let alone the one that is preached by the West. So when it comes to human rights, that is where the you know the contention comes in between what the so-called West has been creating for the past hundred years for the global society. Okay, so the emphasis here is not just the global society; it's individual human societies that are right at the center here. And each human society should be allowed to create their own standards that govern the way it should be run. But what about Western society then? <laughs> should Western society should <laughs> they should have their own set of human rights, but not to impose on the others? Yeah, not imposing on the others. That's absolutely. I think that is the fundamental idea. Does that mean then that the GCI is agnostic? It is one of those, you know, you can bring what you want to it. Or are there actual philosophical underpinnings and ideological underpinnings to the GCI that are particular to it? You know, does it come with any philosophies of its own? Is Chinese Marxism a part of it inherently, or you know, can anyone make it what they want? Delia. Can I just go back a little bit, Sammy? Because、um, I just need to add a bit on human rights as well. Sure. Yeah. In the document in GCI itself, I think that's also a very important aspect, which answers your question as well. It's、uh, is how do you approach the question of the people? I think if we want to see anything that has any relevance to human rights, is really the mentioning of the word people in the document, which is a lot, because GCI basically claims that we must put the people first and ensure modernization is people centered. So that is where humans come in into this document, and to say that development is not about stats on the paper, it's not about numbers. I believe that many countries would agree with that. It's about the well-being of the people. But what is interesting here is human rights in terms of plural. So it's about the people, and people is a very political term. So it has to do with this philosophical underpinning of people versus enemies. So who are our friends? Who are enemies? So people are the friends, but. There were enemies as well. So then, people who are humans who are considered as enemies of the people then don't deserve anything. 
So there was that underlying philosophy in there. So that is, I think, where there won't be much buy-in from many countries is that plural understanding of the rights of the individuals. Because if you look at University Declaration of Human Rights, the first sentence is all human beings are born free and equal with dignity and rights. It's about all human beings, regardless of any conditions that they are in. But GCI is very tied with national security. It's very tied with development. So there were conditions on which that some people are respected, some people are not. Some nations should be respected, some nations are not. If we really look at some philosophical underpinning, but again, we need to look at philosophical underpinning as we interpreted it, but also there were philosophical underpinnings that the text itself articulates. And then there were differences in those two. One of the things that GCI has been compared to is the 1980s Asian values discourse um, from the 80s and 90s. In fact, uh, the Singaporean Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew and Mohatir Mohammed from Malaysia, they were both pushing this through much of the 80s and 90s. Is this similar? What, what are the similarities between what they were pushing for then and what China is pushing for now? Um, the... Asian values debate is grounded in a sovereign state system. So it's about that culture within the sovereign state. So it kind of uh, put itself above the sovereign state by saying that, okay, not all sovereign states are made the same. They have different constituents. They have different cultural components. They have different heritage overlay. And in this case, Asian values or the values that reside within the society that the state has encompassed is something that we should all be taking into account when we look at international relations. So that is the gist of what Asian values debate was all about in the very first place. And Lee Kuan Yew, Mohate Muhammad all talk about the greatness of the Confucius value, the greatness of the Islamic values is a way to bolster this argument. But civilization has a very different idea altogether. I think civilization is not just about something, it, it cannot be something that parachuted from elsewhere, like what is going on in Malaysia and in Singapore. Okay, Singapore in particular cannot claim to be a civilizational state, even though uh, Lee Kuan Yew, during his time, he talked about Singapore having mostly Confucius values. But civilization means countries that can really kind of link back into history, centuries, if not millenniums. Okay, um, China, India, Egypt, Turkey, uh, in more recent discussion, Turkey is really one of those that come into the picture. So those kind of idea that we have a long heritage which we can tap into and whatever society that evolved is a kind of organic evolution of what history has brought to. All right. Whereas more artificial creations such as Malaysia and Singapore, they couldn't actually claim civilizational. Okay, and they are products of what Delia would deem as colonization, and I agree, they are products of that. And they can only say that we are Asian because we hold to certain values. You know, our society is an amalgamation of all these kind of values coming together, but they are not civilizational. In that sense, there's a big difference between what the current CGI is all about and what previously Asian values is all about. But the aims of these two discourses are pretty much similar in a way that they try to unite those have nots within the uh, international system that were very much marginalized by the United States and the West dominance in the global system. All right, And those which has a lot of grievances to talk about when it comes to how universal values are being imposed on their societies, how universal standards are being applied regardless of the local context, all those grieving countries come together and talk about it and form a community, form a kind of brotherhood or sisterhood that, you know, binds them together to fight against Western dominance. So the aim, the objective is very similar, but the audience that it preached to could be very different. Delia, do you agree that the idea of Asian values, you know, from the 80s and 90s uh, is not just a first draft of what the GCI is, that there is a fundamental difference between the two approaches? 
I think philosophically, ideologically, there are fundamental differences. I mean, I think the similarity really is that anti-West sentiment that's embedded in it. I think that's the only only way that I can see how GCI can resonate with some nations or some civilizations is that anti-West uh, sentiment. But then back to your uh, question, Sammy, what kind of Westernization that GCI is against and rationally and what kind of values that it's going to promote, it's not really that clear apart from social core values, <laughs> um, whether that's Confucian values. So Asian values, I mean, as Saki eloquently puts, it's from that sovereign state versus civilization. Not many nations can claim that civilizational heritage. But I think another really key difference here is that GCI has a much bigger global ambition than Asian values. So Asian values is really as a way of resisting and genuinely uh, promoting some of the values that are common to many Asian countries, Confucian values, and there were specific values that many individuals, many people would actually resonate with. Whereas GCI has got that global, it's not about Asia. There was no word Asia at all in GCI or any related document. It's really about global, about Africa, it's about Arabic countries. It's not about Asia at all. So it's not to highlight Asia. It is against the West. But again, documents say it in a very implicit way. Well, then let's talk about some of the criticisms of the GCI since we're going in that direction naturally. Delia, staying with you, what have been some of the main things that people have pointed to the GCI and said, these are dangerous or these are problematic? Uh, I mean, the the key criticism is about what kind of governance really GCI is bringing about. Is it going to bring about a more equal and diverse, as it says, inclusive diversity, inclusion are the key words. Uh, is it really capable of bringing a more equal, just, diverse, inclusive community of the world or is actually going to support authoritarian regime or justify authoritarian regime from a civilizational perspective, using those civilizational argument to support authoritarian regime or dictatorial or totalitarian regime. That's the key concern of uh, many, many people who are watching this GCI and how it depends out. Yeah, absolutely. I think just uh, lends a lot of creditability to the current regime, whichever they are, okay, in uh, governing what is within this country or what is within this civilization for that matter. I point out two contradictions here. First thing is that even when we talk about China as a civilizational state, there's a big problem within there as in, you know, what exactly is China? Is China the one that was created by the first emperor or the current modern state that the CCP govern over? All right. If it's the modern state that CCP govern over, then you are actually not looking at one single human society, not one single civilizational society, but multiple civilizational societies in there. What about the Uyghurs? What about the Tibetans? You know, what about the Mongolians? Okay, all the minority ethnic groups in China all have their own narrative of what civilization is. And what the CCP has been trying to create is one single Chinese civilization. And that itself is a contradiction of reality on the ground. So it creates a kind of tension in there as in like, you know, can we really call China a civilization or a kind of amalgamation of different civilizations? Okay, that's the first contradiction. That brings to my second contradiction. Can civilization sit tightly with how the world is being organized today, which is sovereign state system? Obviously, no. Because sovereign state system was created out from a very different social and political context, economic context too. It's based on colonization, followed by the wars, followed by the evolution of how uh, the idea of sovereignty become the prevalent way of organizing human societies. That obviously runs counter to what civilization is. Civilization has no boundaries. It's a cultural being. It's an ethnic being. Then you will see those sovereign states as what we talk about when we talk about Asian values. So marginal civilizational states like Thailand, are they civilization or are they modern state? Then there is this new debate coming out. Is this the way that we should be ordering our world? Are we still going with the sovereign state system or, or is the world moving on to a civilizational one? 
or back to a civilizational one for that matter. So there is this huge contradiction that this narrative still needs to, to resolve. And I don't think it's fundamentally resolvable, not philosophically, of course, because it means that you need to revamp the entire system to accommodate this. Otherwise, those contradictions and tensions will continue to sit in this discourse. You're listening to Air to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Air to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Air to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which again you can find at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. I'm Sammy Shah, and I'm joined by Dr. Soki Tok and Associate Professor Delia Lin, and we're discussing the implications of China's Global Civilization Initiative. Let's take a step back then and get a broader view. Uh, GCI is the third pillar of post-BRI initiatives announced by Xi Jinping in this decade. The earlier two were the Global Development Initiative and the Global Security Initiative. Delia, can you just give us a brief summary of uh, both of these pillars, the GDI and the GSI? Yeah, um, a good question. And China sees them three as integrated. So that's where exactly where the problems are and really highlights the kind of tension that Saki has just mentioned. Because civilizational discourse should be about cultures, really. And then when you have security, global security initiative, that highlights the importance of national security. And when you have that national security embedded into the three narratives, uh, the three initiatives, Basically, you're putting opposing things together as integrated whole. And the more you do it, the more it will explode. It would explode. So in China's government's own terms, and again, back to the document of global community of shared future, China's proposals and, and actions published in September 2023, they really see those three initiatives as integrated, as complementary, to say that peace and stability, material sufficiency and cultural ethical enrichment represent the three goals of human society. So about peace and stability, that's security. But national security is not just about, and of course, within China, this massive discourse of overall national security outlook, that's basically the guiding ideology in China now, it's more than peace and stability. Material sufficiency, that's about development and cultural ethical enrichment. So to see those three as key pillars of goals of a human society. So when China promotes global initiatives in the three dimensions, from Chinese government's perspective, they think they've covered all. They cover those three complementary and one leads to the other, one supports the other, one is the prerequisite for the other. But that's where the problems are because you can't really put all those opposing ideas together as a whole and hoping they might work together. So, Kate, what's the plan here? What, what does it seem like they're trying? Will China use these initiatives, these three pillars, to supplant policy frameworks within the Bretton Woods global institutions, or will it you know, create new ones that will compete? Um, at the moment, there is no clear indication that China is going to supplant the Bretton Woods system. Okay, I think this is something that we have to make clear right from the start. But will something emerge eventually? It's a big question. I think that's a billion trillion dollar question there. Right now, I think China, by throwing out all this discourse, this is actually creating a kind of uh, problem for itself because of all the contradictions that Delia has highlighted earlier on. They will need some time to try and reconcile those differences if they ever get to that. But progressively, you'll see how these three initiatives will be used as pillars to support China's foreign policy initiatives, as well as the way the multilateral discussions that China will be engaging in. So it will be something that will work parallel with each other. And uh, yeah, eventually what emerge, I think, is not so much about what China wants. Yes, China intended something. Eventually, it'll be something that different forces of foreign policy comes together and uh, create. 
One of the things that um, you both have mentioned is how much this is targeted at the West. It seems to be trying to present an alternative system to the West. One assumes that means that they're hoping for sympathy from the global South. Uh, in both your opinions, starting with you, Soket, and then going to you, Delia, after that, do you think the global South will like the GCI and find it more attractive than the current Western models? Uh, as a discourse, I mean, philosophically and ideologically, I don't think all the Global South would be agreeable to that. In the first place, when we talk about the Global South, it doesn't mean just civilizational states like India or I know, Russia. There are other, a lot of states that were born out from colonization. In fact, easily, if you count more than 90% of the states uh, in the Global South who are considered Global South actually come from uh, are products of colonization and decolonization. So are they going to buy into the idea that, you know, we are all civilizational states? I don't think it's that easy in the very first place. But as a rallying flag of anti-West, I think the GCI is definitely a very appealing idea, okay, that other countries can buy into, especially if, especially if, and that's a big especially if, that China can back it up with its financial clouds. And that is something that is kind of uh, shaky at the moment as we see how China's economy is going. So I think it presents an interesting narrative out there, but the buy-ins, I think, is not as guaranteed as what some academics or observers would deem it to be. Dear, do you agree that the Global South would be a little bit sceptical of the GCI? I agree with that. I hope that I can disagree so we can have a debate. But I actually agree that GCI compared to even the previous, the global uh, development initiatives would have more buy-in because it has money involved in it. And it is to promote Agenda 2030 for the UN. So there was a lot of buy-in for a global development initiative um, because it's, it's in concrete terms. It's about poverty relief. There were lots of initiatives that there was a lot of money that's behind it. With GCI, civilization is a very difficult discourse. It's a very popular discourse within China. But as you mentioned, it's an old term and it has that colonial nexus. So nations are talking about colonization and decolonization, um, but bringing civilization back as a idea, is that going to travel very well amongst the global south? I'm very skeptical of that. But really the only attractive part is really this diverse civilization, different models of modernization. It may encourage the states to think about their own path and to, to link to their own cultural heritage. Beyond that, I don't really see a strong sort of buy-in of this idea. What's the reaction been? It's been a year since Xi Jinping launched the GCI. Has anyone had a strong positive approach to it? I think so far you're probably seeing a kind of welcoming position from Russia. Iran seems to be happy to call itself a civilization, Turkey. Um, but beyond that, I think very few other countries actually saw that GCI as part of their motive to strive a different path of modernity. When we talk about the GSI and the GDI... So the Security Initiative and the Development Initiative, respectively, yes. Yeah, they are sovereign state-based. Okay, I think there is greater responses from the developing countries and the global south in general, as Delia rightly pointed out. But when it comes to the global civilization initiative, it's hard to do it. It's really difficult. Um, okay, then we bring a predicament. China calls itself the Chinese civilization. So is the Chinese civilization inclusive of greater China? Okay, and greater China would well involve Singapore. Singapore would not want to be part of the... Chinese civilization, as far as I see, yeah, they're happy to call themselves Chinese society, but being a Chinese civilization means a very different set of loyalty that goes out of that sovereignty nexus. And likewise, you know, is uh, Malaysia and Indonesia going to be claimed by the Islamic civilization? I, I don't think they're happy to be part of that cloud. But, you know, sovereign states, being what they are, they will try to play it strategically. They will try to see where their biggest interests lie. And they will be careful of choosing the things that they like and discarding those that they don't. So at this point, I think we see greater buy-ins for the security and development part, but less so on the civilization part for that reason. 
Well, then that raises the very obvious question of what are the outcomes? What are the intended tangible outcomes that can be mapped here? The Global Development Initiative and the Security Initiative, both, they have tangible things like loans and military hardware and security forces being deployed on request and development projects, etc., that that can be measured and seen. The GCI seems so vague and nebulous from all your descriptions. How much money has Beijing even committed to this? And, and how will we know or how will Beijing decide whether or not it's a success? I think that is a question best asked to Xi Jinping. <laughs> I, I don't think he has an idea in mind. He hasn't agreed to come on the podcast yet, but we'll keep asking. <laughs> Absolutely. But also, I think another way of measuring success is not just about how much money that is invested in this particular initiative, because this initiative, the purpose of this initiative is to really create that kind of civilizational legitimacy of the CCP. So it's a PR move more than the other two? Yeah. And all the people-people relations that China is doing, the tourism or the Hello China program, they're all under global civilization initiative. So all those people-people relations, they're all couched under that initiative. I think that is one dimension. Now, that's the interesting part. I'm going to disagree a little bit with Delia here. Yes, at the moment, it seems like it's all PR and nothing else. But what eventually transpire will be closer relationship between China and its so-called civilizational partners like Russia, like Iran, like Turkey. Okay, it's really to, to kind of like create a wedge between this so-called civilizational states and the West. Turkey, for example, is part of the NATO initiative, is close to Europe, but it's beginning to be different, to act differently from its European partners. And that presents a kind of opportunity for China to drive a wedge between Turkey and uh, the EU. So I think those are issues that you cannot be quantified, so to speak. You can see greater space for China to talk to all its civilizational partners. I think that is the important takeaway. But is it going to transpire to something that is more concrete and tangible? Well, I don't think that was really much in mind in the very first place. But I go back to my point. If you want to know exactly what they want to get out from it, you have to ask Xi Jinping for it. Well, we can't then ignore some of the global context that's required here. The wars in Ukraine and in Gaza, the US and China continuing to be locked in greater power competitions, the influence of the US and its allies and its legitimacy in certain parts of the global south, etc., being seen as questionable given its alliances with Ukraine and Israel. Does this all result then in the global world order swinging in China's favor? Is China playing a long game here that they might be winning at. Soki, start with you. As what we have discussed, I don't think they are winning. It presents an alternative, definitely. But I think it's a long throw at things if China is going to win this. Because the sovereign state system, despite all the misgivings about it, is actually a very solid system at the moment. Okay, We have not seen an international system that is so rock solid as it is right now. And because there are a lot of winners in this system, okay, the sovereign states, after they decolonize, they have membership prestige in that system. It's hard to say, okay, we are going back to a civilizational one where, you know, some civilization sits above the others and, you know, suddenly there's a hierarchical system, which put some of those smaller states in jeopardy. So at the moment, I don't see that as emerging. But I think there's an alternative there. And uh, whether or not it takes off depends very much on how China and its civilizational allies are going to support this. DDO is still looking for that point of disagreement between you and So Keat. Is this it? Do you think China is winning? I don't think China is winning. <laughs> Again, I agree with Sauke on that, but I do agree uh, that this is a long game for sure. And what I'd like to add to the discussion is also how that works for domestic. Um, China wants to win. I mean, first of all, China really needs to show to the world that its uh, domestic governance is working. At the moment, it's shaky. Um, but I think the relevance of those global initiatives um, throughout our discussion, we mainly look at foreign policies and how China interacts with the world through those global initiatives. But I think a missing point, it's not that we're going to discuss it, it's really how 
how that works with domestic policies. Because if you look at domestic policies, social governance within China, I mean, those global initiatives are working hands in glove with domestic policies as well and project that image that China is leading the world. So I think in that regard, it's successful. Those global initiatives are working in terms of projecting that global leadership of the CCP amongst the Chinese citizens. I think for that part, it is working. But convincing the international communities, I don't believe so. Thank you so much. I'm Sammy Shah, and I'm joined by Dr. Soki Tok and Associate Professor Delia Lin, and we've been discussing the implications of China's Global Civilization Initiative. Thank you both. Thank you, Sammy. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcasts app, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the show, please rate and review it. Every positive review helps new listeners find the show. And please help us by spreading the word on your socials. This episode was recorded on the 30th of January, 2024. Producers were Eric Van Bemmel and Kelvin Param of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2024, the University of Melbourne. I'm Sammy Shah. Thanks for your company.